Hello, welcome everybody. Thank you for your patience, but you've made it. You've made it to one of the most powerful theater experiences of any Alliance theater season. I'm thrilled you are here for the 21st annual Pulevsky Collision Project performance. Thank you. being the Dan Reardon Director of Education and Associate Artistic Director here. Thank you. Um, and I just want to say a couple words about this singular process of collision. So every summer for three weeks, we assemble a group of courageous young artists to collide with a classic text. And this summer, we chose our National Poet Laureate, Joy Harjo's seminal book of poetry, Conflict Resolution for Holy Beings. And I hope you go home. If you do not know her work, this will lead you to it because it promises to reward you. It is gorgeous. So for the past three weeks, these young artists have been wrestling with the themes in that book, uh, uh, living with that beautiful language, and working with artists all over the city to create this piece that you are about to see. But in order to get there, there are a bunch of people I need to thank. And first and foremost, and always, I will start with two visionary supporters who very early on uh, discerned the power of collision and decided to step up and endow it to make sure that in perpetuity, there will be a collision project at the Alliance Theater every summer. Thank you, Benjamin Howard Pilevsky. I also need to thank at and the Coca-Cola Foundation, Georgia Pacific, the Molly Blank Fund, and the Zeiss Foundation for their support of this project. the National Endowment for the Arts, the Fulton County Arts Commission, Georgia Council for the Arts, and the Atlanta Office of Cultural Affairs. Thank you so much. We couldn't do it without you. <laughs> and speaking of the folks we truly could not do this without, those are the lead artists, the guides, the elders who pour their heart and soul into this every year. And I will start with our director who's been doing this for over a decade, and he does it exquisitely, Mr. Patrick McCauley. <laughs> Our associate director and sound designer celebrating his 20th Pilevsky Collision Project performance, the soul of Collision, Rodney Williams. <laughs> our music director, whose work never ceases to amaze me, he's truly a magician with, with music, Mr. David Cote, thank you. <laughs> our associates this summer, Matthew Caleb Brown, Lance Avery Brown, and Barbara Kincaid. Project the Tireless Liz Davis. Yeah. And I need to thank our artistic director for setting this and so many other things in motion that are going to impact generations and generations of Atlantans. Thank you, Susan Booth. Yeah. not do this without our distinguished artist in residence, Atlanta's inaugural poet laureate, the prophet of the Alliance Theater, the one and only Pearl Clay. <laughs> one of the leading playwrights in the American theater and has been for nearly 50 years. But even given that, you must know that not a single word that you will hear tonight was written by Pearl. Because everything, with the exception of the quotes from Joy Harjo, every word, every song, every lyric was created during these past three weeks by these young artists who are about to command this stage. And that is my final thank you to the 17 courageous souls who came here three weeks ago without knowing what they were in for and poured their souls into this so fully and gave all of us a shot of hope, a hope that we desperately needed and a hope that will not let us down. So with that, enjoy the 21st annual Pulevsky Collision Project performance. Everybody has a heartache, what we don't know.
sacrifice for rights which we are now denied. Let freedom ring. Land of dystopia, religious myopia, I mourn for thee. Behind dusty oaken doors, six robed dinosaurs conspire to wage a holy war over our bodies. But the true bell of liberty, she does not mute easily, long may she ring. Her echoes will amplify, marching till morning light, all genders side by side, till freedom rings. Indigenous land acknowledgement and the sincerest effort to gain a further understanding of the history that has brought us to reside onto this land, and to accept the knowledge that colonialism is a current and ongoing process in which we need to further our understanding. We hereby acknowledge this land as Muskogee Creek Nation. Well, are we gonna get it back? Aibabo! Aibabo Hita! settlers. School didn't teach me much at all. The impression of indigenous people that I got was generic. I was given your basic, this is the French and Indian War. This happened, that happened, Indian Removal Act, blah, blah, blah. 
that blah 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 was because the way it was taught had no feeling, empathy, or expression. I was taught very little about Native Americans, besides the fact that they were not good people. My teachers and sometimes other students would constantly describe Natives as disease-carrying savages who ate their horses. Why were we being taught such hateful stuff? We learned that Native Americans had traditions such as wearing feather hats so that we would copy and wear just because it looked cool, like a costume. It was just a day at my school. I was very young, but people who didn't know anything about the Native American culture were just up as them. The first I heard of Native Americans was probably in kindergarten. I remember making brown headbands with red, green, and yellow leaves out of construction paper. My teacher, Miss Wolf, told us that the Native Americans gave the pilgrims turkey on Thanksgiving to symbolize the harvest and making new friends. I didn't really hear much more about them until four years later, when the Redskins football team lost six games in a row. <laughs> While in high school, we learned about three different tribes, but then we never talked about it again. I did see Peter Pan, and there was a Native American character in it named Tiger Lily, but there wasn't a plot line for her. She was just kind of there. I was taught that the Natives made human sacrifices to gods that weren't real. I was taught that they ate their own brothers and sisters. I was taught to hate them for offenses they had no part in. I was taught that the words in our textbooks were the only truth. Western movies shaped my opinion on indigenous people. My perception about them was they scalped and killed anyone who trespassed on their land and attacked stage coaches. I vividly remember watching the movie Seven Alone in fourth grade. It was about a family moving along the California Trail. I recall there was a chase scene in which they were being chased by indigenous warriors. And of course, since we had been following the main characters and had come to care and empathize with them, we viewed the indigenous as the antagonist in that situation. White settlers were always portrayed as either the hero or the innocent victim. I believe I learned none of the real history of indigenous people in elementary and middle school because these were predominantly white schools. The backlash would come from white parents protesting having the skin color portrayed negatively because of these horrible crimes. A lot of my knowledge about the indigenous people came from movies and pop culture stereotypes. Part of me wants to say that's lack to do with public knowledge, but I also think me and my family could have done much more than we did to learn about these cultures. My mother taught me our truth, that we were once called savages too, that white men from foreign lands are not our saviors or anyone else's either. Luckily for me, I wasn't taught anything overtly negative about indigenous people, but as good as it was to be taught nothing bad, nothing at all was worse. Imagine if we natives were in your cemeteries, in your cities, dug up your beloved relatives, ripped off their rings, their watches, and their clothes, and called them artifacts, and then took their bones back to the university to study and try to understand you? Joy Harjo. Consider that there are more native bones in museums and universities than there are those of us living. Joy Harjo. The main thing that I learned was about the Trail of Tears and the horrific events that occurred during that forced relocation. I think so often we're taught so much about slavery and the struggles African Americans have faced in America, we fail to acknowledge what other races have been through. I was taught half truth and just expected to run with it. We are singing a song that can only be sung after losing a country. Joy Harjo. The Trail of Tears was the forced displacement of over 60,000 citizens of the Cherokee, Muscogee, Seminole, Chickasaw, Chucksaw, Ponca, and Ho Chunk slash Winnebago nations by the United States government between 1831 and 1850. This forced removal or ethnic cleansing was followed by the passage of the Indian Removal Act. During the over 5,000 mile long journey to what was called Indian country, over 20,000 indigenous people 
died to starvation, exposure, and disease. Those who resisted were shot. We wondered what the cavalrymen wrote home to their families. We wondered what the first settlers told themselves as they moved onto land that was already someone's home. We wondered how the people who lived here for thousands of years told their ancestors that they would be left behind. We wondered how it felt to be there. I hear my people there calling, wailing, screaming, ripping, storming, vengeance, all the bloodshed, senseless grief must have it all, don't care, the execution pleasure, what we conquer, suffer, destitution, hope. Overshadows my culture. We fed them food. They fed us hatred. My grandmother was buried on this soil. All of our ancestors were. What will happen to them if we all just leave? When 
is brisk. Winter is coming. We have little to no food for this journey. I call on the spirit of war. Please give my people the strength we need to fight back. I am simply following orders. My feet are aching. My head is pulsing in the heat, and not to mention the mosquitoes. But I mustn't take pity on myself. Pity is for the weak and incapable. I am far from that. I am a soldier humbly serving his country, clearing the land for new families to thrive, for mothers to raise God-fearing citizens, for fathers to build banks and churches on top of land these heathens claimed was theirs. Don't they know who God intended this land for? As a settler in this new land, I need somewhere to live. I find it unfortunate that the people here had to be removed, but out of sight, out of mind, no? My mother died in childbirth when she was 20. My father, who was unfathomably in love with her, found himself in torture. He lived without her, but he still lived with her. He walked the same steps she walked every day. It drove him into mania, and he couldn't bear to look at the child who had killed her. So he gave away his only daughter. That's how I came to live with my Uncle Raymond. He was tall, slender, and poor. His wife cuts the mold off of our bread to ration it for the trip. The word is that the government has finally done something about those Indians down south. And that us poor folk will finally get the land that we deserved. Dear Mom, as I told you in my last letter, we just wiped out the tribe in the middle of Georgia. I don't know how much more I can take. We took all their food and supplies. How will these people live? I can't forget the way one kid looked at me as we started to make them move out. I know I'm in the Calvary, but these orders that I'm following are gonna send me to hell anyway. Pray for me, Mom, and my enemies. My body aches from hours of riding, but we finally arrived. Where we were going was lost on me, but I knew we had to start a new life. Mom said this land was lived on by savages. When I asked her what that meant, she just shushed me. One day, I found a doll made of sticks and cloth. Had the people who lived here had children? Could I have played with those children? When I told my mom about the doll, she took it from me. They told us that we'd be moving on to this new land and all I could do was feel hopeful for my future. All this land here for the taking and it could be mine in a heartbeat. I began to pack. I wonder if there will be new stuff there to replace the things that I can't take with us. I haven't thought much about whose vacant land I'll be filling, but who does in situations like this? The government says, here's free land. Are you gonna sit back there and ask a bunch of questions? I know the potential of this land. And the sooner the progress begins, the better. The state is on our side, and I pray it always will be. My promise to my family and to myself is that I will always provide. I must go where I will have opportunities. I will not see those who will have to make way for us, but what better place for Indians than Indian territory? I have no words. My mouth is dry, and as I look to my left, I see my mother is only getting weaker. Why do they call us savages? We are anything but. I am seething with anger.
even as you live. Break my heart, why don't you? Joy. Hard job. We tried to imagine ourselves as a Cherokee girl being sent away to Indian school. When I was younger, my mother used to tell me, nothing is ever truly lost from us as long as we remember it. Be fearless, my girl. That was the last thing my dad said to me before me and my brother were forcibly removed from our home. And as I followed the strange white men to the boat, I made a promise to myself, taking my parents' word, and always remember. As I arrived at the Indian boarding school, and the orderly stripped us head to toe and roughly washed us so that they could get the brown off, I heard my grandfather's words, telling me my brown is beautiful. Throughout the day, when I would hear the handheld golden bell ring signaling the end of class, I heard music. I heard the music of my tribe, the instruments, the singing. I heard the joyous cheers of my people at our native ceremonies. I continue to remember it all, just like my mother told me. On tough days, as a nun drags me by the hair and uses me as an eraser on the chalkboard because I forgot the answer to a math question. As I watch my brother be beaten with razor straps if they caught him speaking charity, I remind him and myself of our father's words, be fearless. So even though I am angry and I feel so much pain, I can scream or cry, I remain fearless. Time goes on, the days blend into months, the months blend into years. During that time, I endure countless beatings, being slapped and knocked to the ground, having my mouth washed out with lye soap, having my hair cut short to resemble a boy. But through it all, I protect my happy memory. I think about happier times, learning to sew in the garden with my grandma, my initiation rite ceremony symbolizing my transition into a young woman. I just try to make the best of my situation. I learn their English, I learn their president, I respect the orderly to stay out of trouble. That is how life goes on day after day after day. But what they don't know is that lunch my brother and I reminisce about our family, our village, our clothing, anything we can think of that reminds us of home. And in our rooms, my friends and I do our traditional dances. At night, I speak quietly, Cherokee, to myself. This is all done in an effort to stay connected to who we really are. So as I stand here today, graduating from Indian school, and finally being free from this purgatory, I am proud that I survived. Not only physically, but mentally. I came here with a name. I came here with a culture, a religion, and a language. I'm not saying that was unharmed in this process, but I leave here with so much of that and so much new knowledge to take to my village. I'm leaving here today not as Martha Lee. That's the name they tried to force on me. But as Ayoka Uzi, a survivor. I survived because I remember. I am here and I am finally free. I will, I will. I will not be controlled. I am sovereign in my body. I am sovereign in my soul. I will, mm, I will, mm, I will not be controlled. I am sovereign in my body. I am sovereign in my soul. I will, mm, I will, mm, I will not be controlled. I am sovereign in my body. I am sovereign in my soul. Grief is killing us. Sadness is devouring us, but we still live on. If you had to leave suddenly without knowing if you'd ever be allowed to come back, what would you take to remind you of home? Some of the most important stories are not told in words, but in objects of use and beauty. Joy Harjo. I would take the photo of my mom and dad from long before I was born. They both look genuinely happy and I treasure it for what it is, a reminder of who I come from. I would take my stuffed animals to remind me of my childhood, my Polaroid pictures of friends and family, and my crystal necklaces to remind me of what peace felt like meditating in my old room. I would take the squirrels and frabs which my late great grandma bought to make me a quilt before she got off writing. They're covered in teddy bears for a little brown girl. The picture of my family at the bottom of the stairs and the cross above the sofa in the den. 
protect my box of letters with my family from years and years of writing to each other. My box of pictures and my grandmother's cookbook. I would take my acoustic guitar, that photo of me kissing my mom before I learned how to pucker, and my journal. I would absolutely take my gold nameplate necklace that says Jada because after her divorce, my mom melted down her wedding ring and had the pure, rich gold transformed into a representation of me in Liberia, where I'm from. I would take that crumpled picture of RJ and me. It's worn with time and I was only four in that picture, still missing my two front teeth. And RJ was in his baby basket. He's been my home ever since I held him in my arms 14 years ago. I would take that animated picture of me, a candle, and some essential oils. Me, my sister, and my mom would always light candles in the house to keep it smelling good and to clear out anything negative. My sister's room would always smell like lavender, so as soon as I would smell the oil, it would remind me of her. The New Testament Bible that my grandmother gave me, the family photo album, and a Macala board set. It's a very simple game, but the parts are easy to replicate, and so many stories can be shared over it. I'd have to take my childish Gambino poster, a bag of Legos, and a small travel vial of a perfume I love called Jazz Club. The poster is slightly used, and that became a running joke. My friends would come into my room, comment on it, and I would introduce it as slightly used. I could connect to all my friends through that poster. I'd have to take a pair of drumsticks with me, so I can create my own music on this journey. Maybe something absolutely useless, like a doorknob or our now useless house keys. I looked everywhere for love, but had no place to go but home. Joy Hardy. <laughs> So put down that bag of potato chips. That white bread, that bottle pop. Turn off that cell phone, computer remote control. Open the door and close it behind you. Take a breath offered by the friendly winds. They travel the earth gathering essence to cleanse your soul. So give it back with gratitude. Join Harjo. Then gather together and share the meal you love the most. On my father's side, it is deeply soul food. For holiday gatherings like Christmas and Thanksgiving, we would have everything from turkey to green stuffing, mac and cheese, cranberry sauce, you name it. And for dessert, chocolate chip cookies, peanut butter cookies, peach and blackberry cobbler, cinnamon rolls, and maybe even some pecan sandies. My grandmother loves to bake. Well, in my family, everyone learns to cook regardless of age or gender. Cooking is a family affair. My grandmother taught my mom and her siblings, who in turn taught my brother, my cousins, and me. Yeah. <laughs> there is nothing like a holiday meal with my grandmother's black eyed peas simmering on the stove. It means something different when you have to walk to the stove to fix your plate. Say it again. <laughs> Let me tell you, there is nothing more satisfying than having an event at someone else's house. <laughs> you ain't gotta worry about the dry ash, you ain't gotta worry about the dishes or any other responsibilities <laughs> like that. There is so much work to cook and prepare all that food. And the moment before you eat, always sucks. You're looking at your plate and you're like, I did all that work for this. <laughs> but when you take your first bite, it's always the best thing ever. Yeah. No matter how much work you took. Yeah. Yeah. The smell of good food consumes the house. Love filling each person, bringing them peace and serenity as they ask for the grave to be passed to them. The one time in the year where drama and grudges are forgotten about. Yeah. Where time seems to stop for just one moment to remind us that we are still a family no matter what. That's right. 
My grandmother always makes this amazing broccoli and cheese casserole. It's my favorite dish. I mean, there's this sense of familiarity to it. And my mom makes some mat meat and mashed potatoes now. Every time they're cooking, not only am I hungrier, but also happier. My parents are actually restaurant owners, so they casually whip out ramen, udon, soba noodles, steak, curry, soup, stew, and steamed pork buns. Absolutely everything comes and goes with rice, and I absolutely do not mind how stereotypical that is. <laughs> <laughs> there are words in Japanese to describe how the texture of the rice should be that I can't quite translate. English fails me in terms of food talk. <laughs> I have to say, one of my favorite meals has to be my mom's famous spinach pie. Each year, she bakes a quarter into it, and whoever gets that quarter is supposed to be granted good luck for the rest of the year. Guess who got it this year? Yeah. When me and my family have a gathering, we love pizza! <laughs> to me, pizza is life. Every time I take a bite out of pizza, it feels like my life has purpose. I feel more loving and outgoing when I eat pizza. But the pizza cannot be processed or have any processed ingredients. It must be homemade and homegrown because you are what you eat. Lentils are the staple of my family. Even if we don't have food in the house, we have lentils ready to prepare, <laughs> always. We like to add avocado and feta cheese to the dish. My mom makes a big pot every single Monday. You know, my dad makes blueberry pancakes on Sundays sometimes. Sure, he uses pre-made batter and store-bought blueberries, but it tastes like he picked them himself. <laughs> also in the kitchen is my mom. Her locks are put up in a ponytail that look like a pineapple. She's making one fried egg for me, scrambled egg whites for her with peppers, and here goes my dad. Baby, can you make me an omelet? You know you always make the best. <laughs> he only says that because he burns his eggs on the bottom. For dessert, my family likes to make a traditional Liberian treat called milk candy. She pours sweet and condensed milk into a large black skillet. Yeah. The milk itself is thick and similar in consistency to melted chocolate. Then she stirs it around until it becomes a thick brown dough-like mass. It's very hot, so you have to be very quickly, you have to move very quickly with it or else you'll burn yourself. Then she rolls the pieces into small balls, puts them back onto the plate, and presses her thumb on each piece to give it a print. It is deliciously creamy and perfectly sweet. Our summer feast consists of arroz con pollo, empanadas, and salty fish soup. There's always more than one table because our family is always growing. Summer feasts are filled with sugar cane cut small for dessert and wet kisses from Tia on the sweaty forehead. There's always dancing, whether it's the salsa, or as the night's ending, the sway my grandparents so love. Every holiday meal I've had on my dad's side has been cooked by my grandma. And we're a little country, so every time we gather in her front yard, we gather to the smell of grilled meat and chitlins wafting from the house. Hey, my Aunt Brenda always makes chitlins. And I used to think they were really good. Until they told me where they came from. <laughs> my dad and his brothers always took charge of the grill. I remember wanting to go cook with them so badly, but I was told, let a real man do this, you're gonna burn something. <laughs> well, it's gonna dinner with my family from all over come to my grandmother's house to eat. The main cooks are my mother and, of course, my grandmother. I call her my nana. The main dish that I prepare is like chicken and rice and a special gravy I love with mushrooms and eggs. <laughs> I'm able to connect with family over food in ways I never could otherwise. Food just bridges a gap between people, even if there's a lack of connection in other areas. Of course, I wish some of us could connect over things other than food, but I'll take it for now. I've looked everywhere for love, but had no place to go but home.
I felt super energized and ready to combat anything negative being thrown my way. It was like my whole body felt so warm and good. The sun made me look at life in a completely new way. The sun made me more connected to myself than any TV show or video game had ever could. If I tried to jump into the ocean and swim, I drowned. Singing the water that is still and tranquil can also be dense and suffocating. The water that sustains me has cut jagged shapes and turned stone into canyons. The water has washed the feet of our ancestors, christened our children. At 11, the water baptized me. At creation, it baptized this land. Um, I haven't had the greatest experiences with beaches, hot sand, muggy water, and virtually nowhere to sit. So going to the beach hasn't been my most favorite thing to do. But on this one trip recently, I decided to get over my prejudice of beaches and embrace the beauty of the one I was sitting on. It was the greatest decision ever. I felt the sand between my toes, almost as if every grain spoke to me. I submerged myself in the water and felt pure bliss. I heard soft sounds outside. Not sure what it was or where it's coming from. I peeked outside my window and it was like rain. I got a bath, I put on my shoes and I ran outside and of course I got wet, but the rain was falling so gently on my body and it was soothing to me. I took a moment and I just stood there. I felt free. I don't like rain. Ugh. I think rain makes things sad. But sunshine makes things happy. I had always hated thunder. It's loud and would shake the house and wake me from my sleep. I loved lightning. The sky always seemed less scary when it was being lit up. As I got older, I realized you can't love one and hate the other. So now, I look forward to gloomy days with strong winds and scary thunder. This lightning will always follow. After the rain, there's a rainbow! Yeah! yeah. yeah. Wait! What about trees? Trees changed my outlook on the world. I used to wonder if they could. Could a tree want to be human? Now I am a human, longing to be a tree. <laughs>
trees have eyes, they know the lies, they know the truth, the truth you hide. They've seen it first, they've witnessed the worst, the blood, the tears, the birth of the curse. erected over the burial ground. This was given to me to speak, every poem in an effort at ceremony. Joy Harjo. I ask for a way in. Joy Harjo. They think they are the right ones. They who slice their for sale signs on stolen soil. They who ravage through the treasures of the so-called savages and house them in glass along with their finery. They love the smooth sound. What is this feeling, they ask. Baby, that's the blues. <laughs> Mind, heavy, thoughts, clouded. Try to fully understand, to fully process how I feel at that moment. Try not to let fear and anger overwhelm, control, consume me. Wondering why so much blood and tears must be shed in order for our voice to be heard. How can we forget what we've learned? We can't forget. America can't forget. Do you feel like you're America? The whole country? No, just your part of it. Point blank, I don't feel I'm America. With how America is, I don't think I ever could be America. At least not in this lifetime. I am America. As a black man, I represent how far this country has come and how far this country has to go. I don't yeah. think I am America, because that would mean I am a part of something that doesn't like me. Yeah. Yeah. Being a white man in America in 2022 compared to 1922 is very different. I mean, I still have the privilege of being most likely to get non-discriminated or most likely to get let go by the cops. Yeah. But just like you, I have no control over my skin color. True. I mean, often I'm told I have no rhythm because I'm white. It's true, but that's not the point. <laughs> <laughs> well, your skin color, your sexuality, gender, religion, physical ability, they all classify you as soon as you're born. They all dictate how you're treated later on in life. So my choices and opportunities are limited. I hope soon that will change. I am America, even though I don't necessarily want to be. I represent a land of dreams and opportunities, diversity and freedom, but it's also a land of broken promises. Discrimination, yeah. aggression, and wicked repression. Yeah. Some places I'm still afraid to go because of the color of my skin, but the color of the sky is the same. Is this your land or is this our land? America's broken. This is true. I do not think that I'm American. This country has done a lot of awful things, such as killing innocent people, yeah. racism, yeah. abuse of power. Yeah. Honestly, it feels like the vision of what America was supposed to be it's not gone. That's because America is where objects have more rights than women. Yeah. For me to like this country more, a lot needs to change in terms of reproductive rights, healthcare systems, school systems, police systems, and conditions in the workforce. I'm allowed to be angry, to be furious beyond belief because I am not my country. Yes, I am an American, but I am not a proud one. I'm tired of being told to take responsibility for other people's actions. Yes. yes, I'm the future of this country, and yes, I have the power to make a little change, but what happens when I try to educate someone who doesn't want to listen? Stolen property, 
stolen people and false prophets collided together. And our history is a representation of that collision. Yeah. 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 Okay, girl. But I'm one of those people who seek change, hoping to shape America the way it should be. I do feel like for America because of our diversity and individuality. Dreams and ambitions all make up the essence of what America is supposed to be. People themselves are what make up America. See, besides this political culture that we have, America is a massive amalgamation of cultures, expressions, languages, and emotions. I am also a massive amalgamation of those qualities, and I am proud to be those qualities. Yeah. Yes, I am America. If everything had been perfectly well and satisfying for my parents in their home country, I would not be here. But for others in this country, the history is much darker than my own. If one group's ancestors had not been so filled with greed, another's ancestors would not have had to suffer so. But together, the people here have created something new and we will continue to do so. I consider it an honor to get to participate in America. We are the new history. Anybody can be a change maker in this country and that is what America is about. It's about the people. Yeah, as long as we have the power of democracy, even though it was built around us with no inclusion of us, we have to use it. If we don't, then what right do we have to sit here and just complain? I wouldn't say I'm a proud American, more like a proud human being. Let's yeah. not shame our eyes to see. Instead, let us thank them for their bravery. Joy Harjo. What will the people say when they hear that sound? The sound of people's voice shaking the ground. Rejoice, cause the shackles broke. Off of our Beloved 
child, welcome your spirit back from its wandering. It may be in pieces and in tatters. Gather it together. It will be happy to be found after being lost for so long. Your spirit will need to sleep a while after it is bathed and given clean clothes. Now you can have a party. Invite everyone you know who loves and supports you. Keep room for those who have no place else to go. Make it a giveaway. And remember, keep this speech short. Then you must do this. Help the next person to find their way through the dark. Joy, watch out. What kept me going was the perfect song I kept hearing. Just beyond the field of perceptible sound. I think it was a freedom song. And it doesn't matter what language the freedom song is in. So long as you sing it loud. <laughs> 